I um, I'm very keen on Johnny Mathis. Well, you're not kidding, are you? When a child is born, blaring out till all hours, when I'm downstairs trying to do some work. Look, the production on that album is amazing. My serious scientific project. I'm going to show you a list of albums. They are in fact nine of the 10 albums that have stood on Billboard's top 200 album charts for the greatest number of consecutive weeks. All of them will be very familiar, but I want you to guess the missing one. I'll give you a clue. It's by the artist credited by the Guinness Book of Records as the third biggest selling artist ever, with over 350 million records shipped worldwide. It's Johnny's Greatest Hits by Johnny Mathis, which spent just under 10 years in the top 200, only three weeks of which were at number one. It was the first album to be billed as a Greatest Hits album, and it came out only one year into Mathis's career, following a phenomenal run of hit singles after he switched from being a neophyte jazz vocalist to a lush pop powerhouse. Johnny Mathis was born in Texas in 1935 and grew up in San Francisco. A prodigious talent, Mathis started as an entertainer at eight, but was also an outstanding athlete at high jumps, hurdles and basketball, drawing comparisons with Jackie Robinson for his all-round athleticism. By September 1955, Mathis was a regular performer at San Francisco's legendary 440 club, where he was spotted by George Avakian, head of Columbia's jazz division and the man who snatched up Miles Davis for Columbia around the same time. So impressed was Avakian that he sent off a famous telegram to New York immediately. Have found sensational 19-year-old boy who could go all the way. Send blink contracts immediately. The contract put Mathis in a quandary. He had to choose between attending the Olympic track and field trials or making his initial recording date with Columbia in New York. In the end, following his father's advice, music won out and Mathis headed to New York determined to be a jazz singer. He may have been disappointed to be assigned instead to the production auspices of Mitch Miller, head of the popular and teen division, and a man who went on, having said rock and roll wasn't music, it was a disease, to become head of A&R at Columbia and managed to see to it that by the time the Beatles broke in America, Columbia had exactly one rock act on their roster, and they hadn't made their first record yet. A man who favoured straight, lush, pop ballads instead of the jazz style Mathis aspired to. After one faltering jazz effort, produced by Avakian and future Miles Davis mainstays Teo Massaro and Gil Evans as arrangers, Mathis adapted well enough, racking up four top 40, one top 20, two top 10 and one number one single in his first year at Columbia. These included the now pop standards Wonderful Wonderful, the 12th of Never and the incredible It's Not For Me To Say. The Bowie endorsed Wild as the Wind and the all-time classic number one, Chances Are. By the middle of the year, a second album, produced again by Avakian but arranged by Percy Faith, Wonderful Wonderful, was in stores and a third, the Miller produced Warm, was out by the end of the year. This run of hits, plus a few non-album and movie songs, formed the content of Johnny's Greatest Hits, which came out in March 1958. Mathis's next seven albums all made the top ten, including Heavenly, which made number one. Bert Bacharach, who co-wrote the title track, complained jokingly that Mathis's version of the song was so close to perfection that anyone else who wanted to record it was scared off by it, which cost him a great deal in publishing royalties. Mathis hit a rough spot in 1963 when he left Columbia and signed for Mercury, hoping to produce his own records. 
that didn't go well. With only two top ten albums and kicking off a run of singles that didn't crack the top 50 until 1978, when his duet with Denise Williams' Too Much Too Little Too Late hit number one. That song was co-written by Nat Kipner, the man who in TRB9 ripped up the BG's contract to allow them to leave for England. Mathis did have a number one in England where he was always a huge star in 1976 with When a Child is Born, the song over which Rowan Atkinson was so enthusiastic in our opening section. And the rest is history. A history we are happily still living as Johnny is still performing to this very day. Except, why is it that Johnny Mathis seems to be the low man on the 50s pop idol totem pole. Even though he outsold, enjoyed wider popularity and enjoyed a far longer career than any of his rivals. He had none of Sinatra's swagger or desperation, none of the cocksure insouciance of Dean Martin. He was sexier than Preppy Perry Como, technically not in the same league as Tony Bennett whose jazz chops were something Mathis had originally aspired to. He wasn't as gregarious a presence as Nat King Cole. He didn't have the vague aura of Hollywood razzle meets hometown boy like Andy Williams. Why is a man who has outsold the Beatles, like the be mop topped ones, and unlike, say, Garth Brooks or U2, Mathis has a genuine and long-established worldwide following, especially in South America? And it must also be said the two men who have outsold him both have had the advantage of dying, which always boosts sales. Why is he these days so underappreciated? It might be that his greatest short-term strength was his long-term weakness. He was a study in ambivalence. Black, but not black. Not masculine, but not feminine. Famous, yet invisible. Omnipresent, yet unavailable. It made him tabula rasa for people to project via the voice, which is one of the unsurpassed instruments for make-out music ever. Their dream lover, or themselves as a dream lover, onto. But there was also what they couldn't hear or touch, the mystery to him that makes him and through that voice, the music, fascinating. It's a mystery he's worked hard to cultivate and maintain. He will admit, as he did in an interview with Forbes magazine, that part of that mystery comes from his obsessive and single-minded dedication to music at the expense of a lot of the personal paraphernalia that surrounds the ordinarily successful. He also candidly admitted how much that cost him and how lonely he could feel because of it. But he has, to this day, persisted with his aura of being a man somehow above this world. While he is said to be extremely loyal and generous as a friend, he chooses friends who know how much he values his privacy and the public perception of him, and they ensure that he maintains it. His life before he sang equally sounds like biographical clippings. Sure, the champion athlete angle was great for the boys in publicity when they were looking for a clean cut American boy to market, but it soon became trivia. His life story had none of the quirky Augie March quality of Perry Como's or the enduring trial, drama and redemption arc of Tony Bennett's. Even his struggles with amphetamines and alcohol didn't come out until long after he'd resolved them. He was an enigma, wrapped in a mystery, wrapped in a shroud of Percy Faith strings. When he closed his eyes and sang courtly lyrics in a voice tinged with tender eroticism, teenage girls secretly swooned, their mothers got hot flushes and a new point of view of the civil rights movement, and a significant portion of their sons, brothers and husbands felt the same. That Johnny was gay was neither held for him nor against, it was simply nobody's business. Mathis once said that as the public started to mature, I had to wait until the rest of the world caught up to celebrities being human beings. When he did come out, it was in a single aside in an interview to US Weekly, where he described being gay offhandedly as, and I quote, a way of life he'd become accustomed to. But his reticence nonetheless, he built up a loyal and numerous gay following in the pre-Stonewall years, the emergence of which would have fostered a world in which his erotogenic balladry helped define identity and consciousness.
Mathis has never attempted to make any traction of or cultivate being a gay cult icon. He's always been refreshingly matter-of-fact about it. He is a singer, first and foremost. That's what he most identifies as. His name is John, and his pronouns are velvet and voice. But Mathis still remains an important figure in gay iconography, whether it bothers him to be or not. Again, because of his own cocoon of intangibility, he is not a prominent figure, not one of the ever-present spotlit Judy's, Freddy's, Morrissey's or Madonna's. He came out early, surprisingly early, and with none of the rather pathetic drama that seems to involve current media-manipulated daily pronouncement on the sexuality of the rich and famous. He is a significant part of that history, but it is history, like his manner, of another age. Pop vocalist supreme, subversive sex symbol, pride and comfort of the downtrodden, and a man who set a 23-year record for the longest charting album in US history. All by virtue of supreme talent, unstinting work ethic, knowing and accepting who he was as America loosened its tie, mixed a cocktail and began to look for symbols of sophistication, of being just one of enough thing to attract like, and not enough of it to repel unlike, and having a voice, a glorious voice that was like nothing before or since. Johnny Mathis is a living treasure. He is the creator of work that has enriched, bewitched and delighted the soundtrack of the classic canon. Please check out the playlist for this video and be likewise enriched, bewitched and delighted. Morgan Minor Freunder. I hope you found today's presentation to be interesting and that it piqued your curiosity. As usual, what piques my curiosity is your response to Johnny Mathis. Um, are you an existing fan? Are you a long time Mathis maniac? Or is this the first time you've ever had the pleasure of indulging in his music? I'd be thrilled to know. Now, I know the question on the lips of my uh, multitude of uh, nine subscribers who are all asking at this moment, but Mr. Quince, but Mr. Quince, you're a hardcore 70s glam rock guy. What are you doing listening to the music of Johnny Mathis? Well, therein lies a story, and let me tell it to you. Back when I was, was a younger Quince, um, the, in the late 60s, early 70s, one of the most popular forms of music we had here in Australia were albums by either Majestic Records, or they were later taken over by KTEL, which were compilations of uh, various Columbia artists, one of which was 20 Golden Grades of the 50s, which seemed to turn up at every party we ever went to. Um, it had artists like Frankie Lane and Marty Robbins and Patti Page and Doris Day and Tony Bennett and Johnny Mathis on. It's also the first place I ever heard Johnny Cash, but particularly Johnny Mathis because his voice sounded so different from everybody else's. And I've simply always remembered those songs. And at some point in my late teens, I bought a copy of Johnny's Greatest Hits, which um, no doubt helped perpetuate its run on the charts here in Australia. And the rest, as they say, was history. Because once that voice gets into your head, it doesn't easily get out. Well, that's some of my tawdry backstory revealed. So until the next time we gather together in good company, or the nasty YouTube police come and shut the channel down, you keep listening to the good stuff, you keep washing your hands and staying a sociable 1.5 metres away from your fellows, and you stay righteous.
Okay, I can make a blooper reel out of that, I'm sure, if, if it's no good.